Howdy folks, this is Big Sam. Some of y'all might remember from a previous video, we took a look at this horrible looking stock that originally came with the Mosinator. And we remember we found out that this stock was either made in 1894 or 1895. And I promised you that eventually we would look at a stock even earlier than this. Well, I'm happy to report that today, we're going to be doing just that. Not only that, but this particular stock is actually one of the first Mosin-Nagant stocks that was ever produced, probably. <laughs> and we'll get into that in a little bit. But this has some really interesting, both early features, but mainly remnants of early features. And this is going to be a nice tie-in to our episode, I think it's going to be episode number four of Legends Never Die, when we actually get to the Mosin. But we're not there yet. We're still uh, currently in the works on producing episode number one. So eventually we'll get to there. And I appreciate y'all's patience in that, because it's a really research-heavy oriented sort of a thing. So I really appreciate y'all's patience and excitement and enthusiasm. But now, enough of that. This stock, what is this? Well, this is an original M91 Mosin Nagant stock. We can see, we can immediately tell this is an M91 stock because there are no V springs for the barrel bands. Because of that, we know this is an M91 stock. Really long rascal, okay? You notice there's a hole here. We're gonna get into that. And another thing we want to notice here is we have these escutcheons. These are Finnish escutcheons because they're solid with this tiny little hole. Russian escutcheons are going to have a big slot all the way through the stock to loop your sling through or the dog collar for the sling through. So these are definitely Finnish. So we already know that this was probably in Finland at one point. So why do I say that this is one of the oldest stocks? Well, we're gonna go from top backwards and we're gonna take a look at some really interesting features. Okay, so going backwards here, the first thing we're gonna notice, you'll see, well, you'll see this hole. This is actually um, a hole because of that initial uh, cut that the fins made in here. They drilled a hole through here so you could loop a Finnish wire swing swivel through here. Well, let me show you what a Finnish wire swing swivel looks like. Here is a Finnish wire sling swivel. So you'd have this long screw go through the stock right here, and then it, screw, it threads into the swivel itself, the screw does on this side. This side isn't threaded, only this side's threaded. So that's why we see a hole through here. Now, this is actually, well, this is sort of finished, it's sort of not. That's gonna come much later in our episodes when we get into World War I, though. This is a weird sling swivel. Okay, so that's why we have this hole here, and then you'll see these little holes. Well, that's just from these little screws here. Sometimes they'll cut into the stock a little bit through there. The really interesting first thing we wanna notice here is this big hole. Why is there a big square hole in this stock? That's a really good question. The main reason is because every Mosin has this little, well, almost every Mosin, is going to have this little metal, it looks like a square, essentially, piece of metal that sits within the stock and has a hole in it that's threaded. And so the reason for that is it sits in here and the cleaning rod, the base of the cleaning rod you'll see has threads and it'll thread into that little piece of metal. Pretend this is a, I know this is a toothpick, but pretend it's a cleaning rod. Uh, sometimes we need to use our imagination for these sorts of things. So the cleaning rod would thread into that piece of metal. Now most Mosins, that piece of metal sits way back right here in the stock. But before 1896, Mosins had their, their, their little um, 
metal deal sitting all the way up here. It wasn't back here, it was up here. Okay, so the cleaning rod, as you can imagine, in order to do that, actually had to be a lot shorter. So this in itself worked okay. The real issue was the short cleaning rods. I think they were something like 15 inches. So you can imagine the cleaning rod, I can get it here, the cleaning rod was only like this long, okay, instead of like all the way over here. That was a problem. So they needed to elongate the cleaning rods. They figured out very quickly, we need longer cleaning rods. And you can imagine there's a lot of reasons why you'd need uh, a cleaning rod longer than this. So in order to do that, you had to then move this thread all the way back here because uh, if you were to elongate it, then the cleaning rod would be sticking out like up here past the barrel. That's not good, no. So that's why we would see that moved. So if you have a stock that with this hole, you know it was made before 1896 because they started doing these modifications in 1896. They would retroactively move these back here and then newly produced guns would not have this hole. Now, typically when you see this, um, this is actually going to be filled in entirely. You'll see just a filled in piece of wood here. Usually you won't see a hole here. This is actually the only example I've seen with just a hole. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here's our Mosinator stock again. If we look here, that's our cleaning rod nut. But let's move up here in the stock. Oh, look at that. It's actually, it's still present on this guy. Remember this stock's old pre-1896 and this is why we know that. It's got this filled in hole here. It's actually kind of hard to tell from the bottom, you can barely see that. They did a really good job of filling it in here. So it's interesting to find one without that plug in it. All right, so that's, that's that hole. And this also is missing the cleaning rod nut here. We can see there's a lot of metal missing on here. Now the elephant in the room is this big hole here. What's going on here? This is weird folks. And let me tell you why this is weird. This hole is so you could put a recoil lug through here. A recoil lug was added into stocks in order to support the 1908 cartridge, which was changed from a bottle-nosed bullet, like this, to a Spitzer bullet, kind of something like this. Oh, this is not a 54R. What is this? I just picked this up. 240 Weatherby Magnum. I don't think they made Mosins in that, but a Spitzer type bullet. So they did that in 1908, okay? And what they found was <laughs> it was actually starting to crack stocks because uh, the action would sit in here and the the this cartridge, the Spitzer cartridge was uh, had a lot more oomph, a lot higher velocity, so you're going to get um remember from physics class for every action there's an evil equal and opposite reaction. In this case, though, an evil and opposite reaction, I guess, because you get added velocity, uh, it ended up getting a lot more recoil. And so the action was sitting here, and when you'd fire it, right, the, the action wants to move back, and you'd start getting all sorts of really horrible stock cracking. So what they initially did was add a recoil lug in here, and you'll see this on really all sorts of Mosin stocks today. Pretty much every Mosin stock you'll see has a recoil lug here. For example, here's a Chinese Type 53 carbine stock. And we can see here it's got a recoil lug, right? So it sits through here that's got this little metal piece here. So the action, it butts up against this metal lug here. We can see right here's metal. And the, and the really interesting thing though is the way this secures is secures, which we'll look at here in a second. But here's the thing. This wasn't the initial thing they did. When they first started noticing they were having problems, they didn't actually add a metal recoil lug. They added a wooden recoil lug. All right, now some of y'all might be saying, well, that seems like kind of a dumb idea. Well, you're not the only one to think that. In fact, the Russians quickly figured out that was sort of a stupid idea. And so pretty quickly, they changed from the wooden recoil lug into a metal recoil lug. 
Now, this poses, and did pose, some problems depending on the gun. Here's why. When they drilled out the hole for the wooden recoil lug, they just, they just drilled the hole straight through. See that? It's just straight through. Okay, and you might, you might not think much of that. And most guns wouldn't have a problem with this because, uh, you know, newly produced guns would just initially have the proper hole drilled out for the wooden, for the, excuse me, the metal recoil lug like we see down here. The real issue comes for the guns that originally had the wooden recoil lug and then they start, then they wanted to replace those again with the metal one because they did this straight cut in here for the wooden recoil lug. Let me show you what this is actually supposed to look like. Let me set this guy to the side here. Ah, all right. So here is a Finnish M39 stock. And if you look here, this is the hole for the recoil lug. Now the important thing to note is this recess right here where, where I'm touching my uh, pointing device on. See this recess and you see it on the other side here. Okay, they didn't just do a linear cut straight through. They did a they did a recess, big a big recess cut, stopped, and then from there they did a smaller diameter cut. Okay, but they didn't do that on this stock. That's because this cut was only for the metal recoil lug. This cut up here was for the wooden recoil lug. So if you have this cut, it's actually really hard to put a metal recoil lug in, you have to, you kind of have to like fill this in again with like wood or something else. I've seen some guns like this and we'll, we'll look at one later in our episode uh, when we're in Legends Never Die when we take a closer look at all of this stuff. But eh, this poses some problems. So this is weird. Finland apparently got this stock and for whatever reason, I think they started to do modifications on this. Like they drilled that. Originally, there were no escutcheons on this stock. So they actually had to cut out a place for the escutcheons. And then they drilled them in. But then they got here and I don't, I guess they just stopped. I don't know. Maybe they tried filling it in with wood. Maybe they looked at this and said, oh, this is a problem. Because you don't really think about this until you actually go and try to install a, a metal recoil lug in here, which I have. And let me tell you, it doesn't work because there's no recess in here for it to bind up against. It's just a straight through hole. So, so this is a little bit problematic. Okay. So long story short, this is weird and it's not really good. But this means it's very old. Uh, the, remember, the, the wooden recoil lug means that this modification was done right around 1909, probably. Right after the cartridge was introduced. Okay. Now, let's look at something a little bit strange. This. What is this? So, we're looking at like a weird piece of wood. It looks like an insert. It's a separate piece of wood. Typically on Mosin stocks, you don't see anything there. On an M39 stock, you have this big pistol grip. But typically, you don't have this big cutout or insert. Well, what is this? Well, that's because initially there was a big piece of metal that used to go in here. And we're going to, again, we're going to talk about this more. And in a future episode of Legends Never Die, we're actually going to take a closer look at what went here, because it's really interesting and cool. But what I can tell you is that they stopped doing that around the middle of 1893. So already from this, this is what really helps us date this. We have this feature here. We know that the stock was produced before the middle of 1893, which means this is a very old stock has a lot of interesting stories to tell us. Now, some of y'all might look at this and say, well, this looks really ratty and beat up. Well, it is, but I tell you what, this has a lot of interesting history. And overall, it's actually in pretty good shape. There's no big cracks here that I see. I mean, I don't really see any cracks here. 
It's in quite nice shape overall. I'm really impressed overall. Now, you'll see this little shim here. This Oh, there's one little crack. This is really typical to see cracked, this portion. And usually back here, too. Uh, but not a not a huge deal. Now, you see these brass shims in here, okay? These were added by Finland. And this is what also puzzles me. They they got here and they were like, huh, I don't know what to do here. But they, they added these brass shims, so they cared about accurizing this stock. Um, and typically what they do is they would place the brass and then they just put a uh, like a pin or a rivet and they just drive it through there. They just tack it into place like that so it's not going anywhere. I don't know <laughs> why why they did that. Maybe they maybe they were able to fill this in and this just came out. Someone removed that and maybe that's also why this is gone. Maybe this was in like in a totally complete and working gun at one point in Finland's possession. I don't really know. It's a big mystery, but a really interesting one nonetheless. Okay, so we've seen that this stock has a lot of really interesting early features, and it shows us how to date stocks, especially early ones. But there's one more interesting thing I want to show y'all. You might notice there's, a, there's no butt plate on here. Well, check this out. If we look on the back, we're going to see some really interesting markings. Okay, now the one I want to point out is this big marking here. We see what looks like an H and then a Roman numeral 2. Okay, this is actually two Russian letters. This is N and P, as in Nicholas Papa. Okay, and then we see a crown over it. Now, I'm still trying to find out more info. There's no info on this. Here's what I can figure out about this. One, I did find a reference to whenever you see a Russian proof mark with a crown, that usually means that it's an inspector's mark, and that inspector was some form of royalty. I don't know how much validity there is to that, but it's an interesting theory, and it's one that I'm looking into more. So theoretically, this there may have been a stock inspector whose initials were NP, and he was part of the royal family somehow. Very strange. Now, this, this marking I've done, I've done a lot of research, and I've looked at a lot of examples. You only really see this marking on antique stocks produced by the Tula factory, which is what we have here, as far as I can tell. This is a Tula stock. And the way I'm able to discern that is from the finger groove pattern here. I've looked at a lot of stocks, and you can actually get a pretty decent understanding of who made stocks by this finger groove pattern. Now, we're going to have to do a more complete video to talk about all the ways we can kind of tell. But judging from this pattern, I can tell you this is almost certainly a Tula stock. And I can tell you this is definitely a Tula stock because we have this NP proof mark here. Now, there's one other interesting marking. Look down here. We see a 9 and then a 1 and then a G. It looks like an R. Now, remember, we had a video talking about that marking. That means year. So this is marked 91 year, which is really fascinating. Now, I've seen this marking a lot of times, and when I have seen this marking, it's also associated with this NP marking. So it seems like the Tula factory, or whoever they got their stocks from, or who was inspecting them, would mark the date on the back on antique models. And I've seen examples range from 91 to, this is only 91 I've seen. I've also seen, I think, 94. I've seen 98, I think. So, and it all makes sense. Those are all, those are all antique stocks. So it kind of lines up with our theories on what this is. 91. But this is really strange because this, if this was actually 91, they basically didn't make any Mosin stocks in, or any Mosins in 1891. They just barely started production in 1892. So when I see this, this really tells me, con and combined with this fact, that this probably is one of the first Mosin stocks ever made. Very, very cool and very, very bizarre. Uh, 
hopefully we never bore y'all with looking at uh, uninteresting things, because I think some of this stuff is just flat out cool and weird. And hopefully y'all do as well. So we have here probably one of the oldest Mosin stocks ever made, and one of the projects on the channel is we're probably not ever going to shoot a gun in this stock, but what would be really neat to do is replicate the wooden recoil lug. So that's something I'm currently looking into, along with everything else we're doing on this channel, which is, well, a lot. But an interesting thing here, a wooden recoil lug, because you don't really see too many with a wooden recoil lug. So it'd be kind of cool to see what that would look like. Oh, and another pro tip, if you see this hole right here in the stock, you can see light on the other side. That also is an indication it was from Finland, because early on, Finland would actually pin, uh, like, or basically a pin. They would take a, a long pin, and they would drive it all the way through the stock here, and it would go through the barrel band. So oftentimes, you'll see a barrel band with a hole on the side of it. And that's because they had a pin that went through all the way through the stock. They figured out that was not really necessary at some point, so they stopped doing that. But you'll see remnants of that. One other neat thing up here on the front is you'll see these little... It, so what this is is actually a piece of rubber, as far as I can tell, with these little tacks through it. Why do we have that? Well, this is actually a shim for the barrel band. One of the problems that the Russians realized quickly, even after like the Russo-Turkish War, or excuse me, not the Russo-Turkish War, the uh, Russo-Japanese War, I get my wars mixed up sometimes, was that the barrel bands would often come loose. And so one of the ways you can fix that is you just shim it, and this is going to make it a lot tighter fit. You'll see, you'll see this occasionally, and there's all sorts of different methods they did. Sometimes you'll see metal like inserts here on the sides it, it really the the different uh, areas and variations of barrel band shims on mosins is a really fascinating topic and i think we need a couple videos dedicated to that but this is certainly cool you don't typically see this it's it's relatively uncommon to see the shims now that being said uh, i haven't really taken up of the mosins i've looked at I haven't specifically taken off all the barrel bands to look and see, oh, does this have shims? But it's one other thing to note if you have one and you're ever taking off the stock, because I just think this is cool. I don't know who did this. This could be, you know, 80 years old done in Finland. This could be 120 years old done in Russia. We don't know. But it's pretty cool, folks. All right. Well, I think we've done enough ranting about uh, Mosin stocks for one day, but I hope y'all enjoy taking a little bit of a deep dive at a really fascinating Mosin stock. So let me know if y'all got any prayer requests, and stay tuned for what we got coming up next, and I'll see you next time.